I will, and I do, but I was not. I guess you're right. I'm thinking about it now. And do you think that's what makes her considered so beautiful? A giant brick of irony. You know that she did not start performing until she was 50 years old? Holds the record for being the book most often stolen. You don't find that ironic? No! Ah! Hey, John, how are you today for this episode of Smart Dribble? I'm great, Kurt Schneider. How are you? Well, good. As you mentioned, I'm Kurt Schneider, your co-host, along with John Ellenthal, my fellow co-host. And this is what, John? This is our latest episode of Smart Drivel. I believe it's episode number 71, which what? I think might be a prime number, Kurt. <laughs> Whoa, you just blew my mind. Is when it a prime I number? I think 71 is a prime number. When it gets above seven, I'm in trouble. Well, you have 10 fingers and 10 toes. You think you'd have more capacity than that. You know, since we talked about fun math, may I throw some fun math at you, Kurt? Go for it. Right off the bat, I love fun math. You do like fun math? Yeah, because of pi, 3.14567. Yeah, in fact, our first episode of Smart Drivel Ever was about the number pi, sort of. All right, so here's a great math thing I just learned. If you multiply the number 111, 111, 111, times the same number, which is 111 million, 111,111 times itself, the answer is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. And you're probably wondering, what is that long number? It is 12 quadrillion, 345 trillion, 678 billion, 987 million, 654,321. So it sounds like when expressed in numbers, it's a lot more cool than when it's expressed in words. Holy cow, but I love the fact that you're one, 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 one times one, 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 one is all the numbers up and down except for all zero. The numbers up to nine and then back down to one. Love that. You I know, mean, that was the first time I've ever said out loud a quadrillion number. In fact, it may have been the first time I ever used the word quadrillion. Which is pretty cool, which I thought was a made up number, but then it makes sense quad before tri, trillion, bi, billion. So there we go. Ooh, look at you figuring stuff out. So I had lunch with a friend today and he told me something I just thought is very allegorical for our life. Ooh, I love allegories. He said it was probably in the 19th century. In up and around the Boston area, New England, there was a prison riot. And there was a riot because these guys were so upset at what they were being forced to eat at every meal. They were given lobster. Yeah. So lobster way back when was considered food for people who didn't have all that much money. It was for service staff and prisoners. It's pretty crazy how that's changed over time. Well, and that wasn't the allegory. So you actually ruined oh. my allegory, but that's fine because I didn't know what you said. I didn't realize it was for those people. I thought it was even hoity toity back then. And so what I was thinking was the allegory was, huh, isn't that the old thing of too much of a good thing becomes a bad thing? And we always think we want more, more, more. But sometimes the more we want, it doesn't, we don't like those things. So everything in moderation, I guess. And how does that pertain to lobster, Kurt? Other than the fact that you're wearing a red shirt. Lobster is considered an amazing meal, or at least now it is. And so it's too much of a good thing. They ended up hating it at the end of the day. Yeah. I think what's interesting is how something changes over time. So it's once considered a food for poor people, you know, a hundred years or so later, it's considered a delicacy for the affluent. The fact that that stuff can do, basically, you can reverse the polarity of the switch entirely is pretty cool. Kurt, you are an art aficionado, yes? Sometimes, John, sometimes. You have been known to go to museums, whereas I have been known to go to museum gift shops. Which are also wonderful. Also wonderful. 
Would you say that the Mona Lisa is the single most famous painting in the world? By far. By far. Mona Lisa in the painting has no eyebrows, Kurt. Did you know that? What? Mona Lisa has no eyebrows. I guess you're right. I'm thinking about it now. And do you think that's what makes her considered so beautiful? I don't imagine the absence of eyebrows is the single contributor. My guess is it's an amalgam of lots of little things like most things in life. But I just think it's amazing that you have this extraordinary painting, beautiful image of a woman and she's missing her eyebrows, which is a personal choice in this case, not made by Mona Lisa herself, but I assume made by Da Vinci. I don't know about that. It's, you know, fashion changes over time. We talked about Belladonna and the women would take this poison to make their pupils bigger. Maybe at her time, it was considered the creme de la creme of beauty to have no eyebrows. Maybe when she was posing for the photo, she just forgot to take out her eyeliner pencil and draw on her eyebrows. But you're telling me Mona Lisa had no eyebrows. Okay, I will go back and look. Well, why don't you just believe me? I'd like to go look at it as well. You know what? I'm going to take that to an next dinner party regardless and uh, say it because that's what I do. I think that is what you do. And speaking about that, you know what's something I learned the other day? Besides besides my lobster, my lobster prison riot, that Coca-Cola, the drink, was originally green. Ah, you know, it's been a big week for you learning both of those things. When did it stop being green and start being known for the, I guess, cola colors? Is it brown? What color is Coke? Caramel brown. You call it caramel brown? That's a very interesting question. What color is Coca-Cola? It's kind of like got a blackish brown thing going on, right? This would be a good time for me to acknowledge that I'm colorblind. You know, that's a problem with society, John. (laughs) I love when you start a sentence like that, Kurt. So I'm going to hit you with a giant brick of irony. I love irony. I think irony is, is the subject matter for most humor in the world. Do you know what book holds the world record? for being the book most often stolen from public libraries? Yes, indeed. The Guinness Book of World Records holds the record for being the book most often stolen from public libraries. Now, why are you stealing that one? I would think that you'd probably steal a book because it's something that you're either you can't get elsewhere or you're embarrassed to check out, which is why I thought Dollars to Donuts the number one stolen book from a library would be the Karma Sutra. That would make sense because that would embarrass most people. Right? I'd be embarrassed checking that out, but I wonder if today's generation would because they have access to this thing called the internet, right? Yeah, I don't think they have to uh, do any of that stuff, uh, any of that research in public, Kurt. We used to go to the library in freshman year in high school and we would we would look at Paris Match magazine because sometimes there was naked women in there. It was fantastic. And when you graduated from National Geographic? Yes, exactly. Kurt, is there anything more embarrassing for a teenage boy than going to buy condoms? And that moment when you walk up to the counter and you're anticipating who's going to be there and what they're going to think, and you're afraid to make eye contact, that is, that is a big moment. Cause of a lot of angst. And you'd think it would be a cause of pride, but it's a cause of angst. And I think it goes back to original sin feelings, right? Guilt because uh, we ate the apple and God told us not to. Getting all biblical on me, Kurt. I think it is original sin that that has made its way into, into the psyche of humans throughout time. And we have it built in us, which is sort of like our operating manual when you reset to, uh, to operation you know, reset to factory settings. You think that people should be able to reset to factory settings? That would be helpful. We do pick up a few bugs along the way and some apps that maybe are not so good to have attached to our operating system. And there ain't no software updates with us. And I think there should be. Well, I think there is in concept software updates because that's us learning and becoming more capable. But it's the stuff we bring in on top of it that we need like a software like, you know, clean my Mac or clean my PC for the human operating system. May I stick with irony, Kurt? Sure. The cigarette lighter. By the way, I don't do irony. I've never learned how to do it. I can't, I don't know. I go to hotel rooms with people on business trips 
and I wear wrinkles because I don't know how to do it. You go to hotel rooms with people on business. You want to just unpack that for us? No pun intended. On business trips, I've been in hotels with people, not the same room. And I have shown up wrinkly because I do not know how to iron. You know that years Johnny was improvised? I did not. I did not. Jack Nicholson. That's yeah. great. There are some great movie lines that have become the, you know, the most memorable lines of their films that were improvised. And may I stick with Jack Nicholson here? I keep asking permission today. I'm in a very polite mood, feeling very etiquette-y. Yes. Or etiquette-ish. Who are you, Emily Post? I am not Emily Post, although... You know, you know which one has gone out, by the way, that we used to follow? A rule of an Emily Post rule? Wearing white after Labor Day. People do it now. They wear white all year long. Yes, it's, it's clearly one of the signs of the Armageddon, both yeah. power, the proliferation of PowerPoint and people failing to respect the no white after Labor Day. What issue, next, Kurt? They don't even feel bad about it. They don't even feel guilty about it. They just flaunt their white like it's nothing. And it's October or November. The, the very pillars of society continue to fracture and crumble. I promised you some irony, Kurt. I have white bucks, John, and I don't wear white bucks before Memorial Day or after Labor Day. Well, maybe you just ought to relax a little bit because you seem to have a lot of rules. A little well, anarchy would be good for you, Kurt. Emily Post got it right. And that's one of them. Here's another one. You don't want to hear about my irony, huh? I God, do. Please. RSVP quickly. People don't do that. that. To this day, that people don't do that. They wait and they think it's like, they think, oh, maybe I won't hurt their feelings if I wait. Or am I FOMO waiting for something else? Are you in or are you out? The people who are throwing the party want to friggin' know. Well, I think a prompt response and, of course, being on time are very, very Emily Post-ish. And I think those have indeed survived, generally speaking. I promise you some irony, Kurt. I'd like to get some. The irony is that Emily Post was known as a boorish, rude woman. No, she was not. Okay, I, I made that up. I'm sure she was lovely. But I did promise you some irony. And here it is, Kurt. The cigarette lighter was actually invented before the match. Why is that irony? Because you'd think that the cigarette lighter replaced the need for matches, at least as it pertains to smoking cigarettes. Why? You don't find that ironic? No. Now, did you ever hear the, did you ever look at the lyrics carefully of Alanis Morissette's song? That is in there. None. Okay, this, it's not in there. This is irony. The cigarette lighter being invented before the cigarette. That is irony. But before the match. Well, I think most people who buy a cigarette lighter are doing it so they don't have to carry matches. Don't you think? Maybe if we smoked, we'd have a better beat on this one. Uh, I no. I, I did hear, by the way, the other day that Phyllis Diller didn't really smoke. Oh, she just had. What is that thing she had in her mouth that extended the cigarette? What's the name of that thing? Like a cigarette holder. That was really quite of an elegant Hollywood upscale fashionista stylish thing, wasn't it? Because it was a prop. You know, you could move it around. It, it, I knew it was it a got, weapon. Yeah. Do you, think it, do you think it gave her greater presence? Do you think it allowed her to point at people without pointing at people? Of course, she still would be pointing at people. Yeah, the answer is yes, yes, and yes. Where I think cigarette holders like those are a little odd are in men. Well, I think they're a bit feminine, but I don't, I don't think it's a problem for men to be somewhat feminine. Do you, Kurt? It's not that they're being feminine. I just think it's an odd accoutrement. It doesn't seem to fit. Like, it's kind of like, like it's kind of like green Coca-Cola. Audrey Hepburn, Holly Golightly in Breakfast at Tiffany's had a beautiful cigarette holder thing, the big long thing. But, you know, you got FDR and the Penguin in Batman and Robin wearing them and they go. Kind of weird. <laughs> the longest word in the English language, Kurt, without a vowel is the word rhythm. Now, we once debated whether Y's were vowels, and I think this concludes in my favor, that Y is not a vowel, because if it were, rhythm could not be the longest word in the English language without a vowel, correct? And if your lorry got a flat in London, what are you changing out? 
What do they call their tires? Tires, but it's T-Y-R-E. But it has an E on the end, so it does have yeah. a vowel. Right. <laughs> John, you seem to be, I think you either had cereal this morning, maybe it was Frosted Flakes or Cocoa Puffs that had something inside it with like... I'm cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs, Kurt. Did you, was it like 10 things you should know this morning? Because you have these wild things today. I just, you know, you started talking about, you know, lobsters and the history of lobsters and Coca-Cola being green. And that sort of just sent me off on a bunch of crazy little things that, that are kind of smart drivelly, Kurt. That got you to the Mona Lisa doesn't have eyebrows. Well, don't you think that's interesting? Are you happy to know that or not? I, I'm very happy to know that. Now, what is the difference in humans? What does it mean when humans have earlobes that are separate from your face and ones that cannot separate off the face. What does it mean? Yeah. There's a meaning? Yeah. I know that there's two different kinds and it's genetic, but what do they mean? I do not know. I'm not afraid to say I don't know, Kurt. That's what I like about me. <laughs> As my friend John says about me and, and some of my fraternity brothers, three words you'll never hear us say. I don't know. Yeah, well, you might want to embrace that. It's really quite liberating, <laughs> Kurt. <laughs> so what were you going to say? I was going to say, give me that one of these other things you're talking about. Well, weren't you just telling me something about polar bears? You think I'm any different than you are when it comes to these little silly little facts that we're happy to know? What is it about polar bears, Kurt? All polar bears are left-handed. Okay, you see, that is very much within the gestalt of what I'm talking about here, Kurt. And by the way, I think you, well, you didn't start it with lobsters. I think I started it with that crazy math thing, which I think is really interesting. I'm happy to know. I'm enriched by that. I'm going to give you a sentence that uses every letter in the English alphabet. Would you like that, Kurt? We know this one. Then tell, tell our listeners the answer. Someone would get it right. We learned this like in fourth grade. The lazy brown dog jumps over the fox or something like that. Yeah, I don't know what the fox and dog were doing behind each other or not, but the, I think the answer is the quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog. Aha! And that uses every letter. And by the way, I didn't go to some fancy fourth grade school like you that has such a rich curriculum. I did not learn that in the fourth grade. Well. Huh? Uh, but isn't that, it's a mnemonic. It's like how we know the, as we talked about before, how do we know the Great Lakes? Homes. Well, you, you actually taught me that one as well. So we learned these things. Probably I learned it. You must have had, you must have had like an entire mnemonic curriculum in that school there. I tell you my 10th grade Spanish teacher, 10th grade. Senora. Senor. Uh, Ooh, look what I did. I, I, I did a gender bias thing there. Yes, Bad sir. on me. Yeah. And he was great. I just thought of it. I just forgot his name. Quantro. You know, see, anyway, he was amazing because he taught us Spanish by teaching us Spanish art. So Ooh. we learned about Velasquez and El Greco and Goya and, of course, Picasso and everyone else. But we learned Spanish by learning art. How smart is that of he? Because we forgot we were learning Spanish because we were learning art and vice versa. We forgot we were learning art by learning Spanish. And to this day, some of the knowledge I have about great Spanish art is because of that 10th grade language class. Yes, it's this whole idea of infotainment. If we are enjoying what we're learning about, consuming, experiencing, then the learning is just a natural byproduct of that. But we're not focused on resisting what someone's trying to teach us. I have another fun fact for you, Kurt. Oh. I'm going to litter these through our entire conversation. The longest word you can type with your left hand, that part of the keyboard. With just your left hand? Yeah. Longest word you can type with only your left hand. A-U-N-M-K-L-I-O-P type of stuff, huh? Yeah, but a word, Kurt, not a series of letters that don't add up to anything. So I would say it is probably varsity stewardesses. Now, of course, they're called flight attendants now, but that wouldn't really qualify. But stewardesses is the longest word you can type with your left hand. So you know where I screwed up there? I didn't think that you could use the same letter twice. 
Yeah. And I didn't say that. You just imposed that just like we all impose self-limiting thoughts, which is crazy. We're so mean to ourselves, Kurt. It goes back to what I was saying before. When we have, it's, it's this inside, all humans are born with some very similar regulators, like governors on an engine. And sometimes people take them off and that's when we get Al Capone. And sometimes you keep them on and that's when we get Mother Teresa, when it gets even tighter. Well, I think we get the Al Capones when people think it's okay to wear white after Labor Day, Kurt, because that is a breakdown of, I mean, this is a society. There have to be some rules or else it's just, you know, a primordial soup of anarchy. How about people that are wearing linen after Labor Day, wearing, using a, a, a cigarette holder? Yeah, Phyllis Diller. She is probably the one that comes to mind first, right? When you think of those long little cigarette extenders. You know that she did not start performing till she was 50 years old. Wow. So was, said another way, Kurt, there's still hope for us. Exactly. She, yeah. she would do all these jokes and write them down, but just for her friends and neighbors. And then her kids got older and she decided to do it. What was she? So for the first 50 years, she was homemaker, homemaker. And then she just sort of busted out. Mm-hmm. And she had a whole file, which she, I think she donated to someone of jokes uh, that she would like type on index cards. Oh, that's fun. We should write down little ideas during the week, although we don't have to do it on index cards where we have little ideas for the podcast, like that lobster thing of yours. Exactly right. We need some sort of digital device where we can capture our thoughts in real time and then access them easier later for the podcast. Look, you're making fun of me as being a Luddite. I was not. I was not. I will and I do, but I was not. There's power in actually also writing something down. By the way, I, I think the human brain is such that it's wired that by writing something down, it helps you. Well, I think that's true. I think, in fact, I think from a learning standpoint, I think a lot of people believe that the final stage of the learning process is sort of publishing your knowledge. And while that's not exactly what you're talking about, you are publishing and there's there, you know, manifesting that in the real physical world has to be part of that. Well, it doesn't have to be part of that, but it makes sense that it would be. So you're playing the polar bears in baseball. Are you stacking your lineup with righties, right? You know, you don't have one Southpaw, one lefty hitter in the whole lineup. You're probably not only doing that, but I think you're going to, Try to hit the ball to the third baseman as much as possible because you don't see no left-handed third baseman or left-handed shortstops for that matter. So you'd have a big advantage hitting the ball if you are a righty against a lefty polar bear pitcher to the left side of the polar bear infield because they're really playing out of position. They might end up just eating you and then that, I guess that's how the game They do have that advantage and they probably could outrun you and their claws are obviously quite a bit sharper. By the way, you know what's interesting when you go to Europe... And you go to the ho- people's houses, the hotels have now gotten it. They used to not get it. And you clearly in the house or in the hotel room, the shower was such an afterthought. Yeah. And it put on something in the corner and just horrendous. And it's a center spray coming down. Yeah. Just, European it. bathrooms are a different deal. What is the biggest item you ever stole from a hotel room, Kurt? A blanket. And you liked it very much or you were feeling cold or you were having like a Linus moment? I believe we were in Munich at Oktoberfest and some of my friends were sleeping outside in a cemetery and they were cold. And I thought we might be sleeping the next few nights outside. So I think I pilfered the blanket. You think it says about humanity that the television sets are bolted to the furniture in a hotel room? What was the biggest item you stole from a hotel room? I don't think I've ever stolen anything. Very big. I remember being in a Tim Hortons in Canada once, and I really, really wanted the Tim Hortons mug. So I took that, but I don't, I'm not a big stealer, Kurt. Okay. I mean, I'll, I'll think about it. Maybe we should dare each other to steal some really significant item and then report back. We probably can't do that. We have to change our names for that episode, Kurt. All right, everyone. Thank you for listening to this episode of Smart Drivel. This- what was it about, Kurt? Well, it was clearly drivel today, but you know what? We enjoyed it. And maybe you guys learned a fact or two. I certainly did. All polar bears are left-handed and the Mona Lisa. Hang on. And no eyebrows. That's right. We discussed art history. Mm-hmm. We discussed... Contes. Mr. Contes. That was his name. All right. And someone else you've never mentioned and don't mention on the podcast, your Spanish teacher, Mr. Contes. 
Kurt and I will be back next week with a brand new episode of Smart Dribble. Until then, we hope your week is filled with Smart Dribble. Thank you, everybody. Bye.